Welcome, everyone. Um, it's not every day you get to introduce your favorite client and bring them to show and tell. So I'm, I'm really delighted to uh, hand the floor over to Glenda, Ron. Um, Glenda, why don't you just take a moment to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you for um, having me join you today, Jan, to share some information about Support Ontario Youth. I am the program director for the construction sector for Soy, and I'm really excited to come to you to speak to you from the perspective of a frontline worker, grassroots, um, talking to apprentices, employers, ministry reps, educators, and other stakeholders in apprenticeship. Um, we have a lot of information to share, and I'm excited to be here. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and my name is Jan Vanderhoop. I'm a president and co-founder of a company called Fit First Tech. Uh, we've been around for over 15 years. For most of that time, our focus has been on employers and giving them tools to screen in the right people for their organizations. And it's really about four years ago, we started playing around with an upside down version of our software. Uh, and so I was actually one of our very first clients. So that really the, the, the focus, the, the, the story that we're going to be telling today is, is primarily about soy. So Glenda, you're going to be carrying the bulk of the conversation. Um, you know, the context uh, at a very high level is that um, soy is a not-for-profit that was established by the Ontario Electrical League um, in response to some chronic staffing shortages in the apprenticeship space, and particularly in electrical apprenticeship. Uh, which Glenda is going to expand on shortly, but um, you know, not like, uh, not unlike um, apprenticeship in general. Um, you know, small and mid-sized employers, in particular, were having a really tough time finding apprentices for their open positions, and um, and they just didn't exist in the marketplace. And so, it, what was what was really cool is the the league, as an industry association, stepped up uh, on behalf of their members and. Um, and cobbled together a solution that's been hugely successful. So fast forwarding to the uh, to the end of our story, just for the sake of um, baiting the hook a little bit and making sure that those of you who are uh, hearing this presentation are in for the duration. Um, this is this is not the before picture on this slide. This is the three years in picture. Um, but I think you know what what you'll see at a glance here is some pretty startling results in an environment where we began with the enormous scarcity. Now, all of a sudden, the industry is shooting the lights out in terms of uh, their hiring objectives. Satisfaction rates are at results at levels not seen previously. Um, attrition, which had you know, always been seen as sort of a drag and a cost of doing business, uh, has gone down to single digits. And in this world where you know we've got such a focus and priority around DEI and removing barriers um, um, and screening people into open positions, um, uh, almost as a byproduct, I would say, um, soy has had some tremendous results here. And so, if this is the the after picture, um, let me start for a little bit with the, the before snapshot, and then Glenda, I'll hand it over to you because. Um, you know, you you were up to your eyeballs in in that reality before we uh, before we began this work. But before I hand it over to you, I think what I'd what I'd like to establish is um, that there there are some differences, but not major differences in apprenticeship between Canada and the U.S. And so, over the course of our work, we've we've done a significant amount of um, work on both sides of the border. And what's been interesting to me, particularly in the last three years is when I'm speaking to folks in, um, in the US and they realize that we're a Canadian company, we do work on both sides. Often what I hear from folks is, oh my God, Canada does such a better job in apprenticeship than we do here. And um, I, I'm gonna tell you, no, that's not so. I, I would say the structural elements are a little bit different. The, the, the regulatory elements are a little bit different, but the landscape by and large is very, very similar in the sense that there are chronic talent shortages on both sides of the border. Parents have long looked down their noses at, um, at, at skilled trades and at other apprenticeable positions and, and said to their kids, there's no way you're going into that. So they've suffered from a really bad image and bad PR and, uh, and for no good reason, honestly. And so um, 
you know, this is this is time for a bit of a renaissance. I'd, I'd hate for anyone here to be watching this presentation, participating in this presentation with the mindset of, well, it's okay in Canada, it's different here in the US. It truly isn't. And there's no reason why the solutions that Soy presented uh, can't be equally effective in, uh, in, in either marketplace, quite frankly. So, so Glenda, if I may, let me hand it over to you to paint a pretty be bleak picture of what it was like before we got going. Right, I have no problem doing that. Um, and I can also say I'm not gonna be without work with the amount of work that we need to do to improve um, the apprenticeship system uh, in Canada. It's definitely a tough system to navigate. As Jan mentioned, um, there is that stigma still there. Uh, even educators within the high school system, they don't know how to promote apprenticeship, so they just don't. Um, it's a pathway that they, they're not aware of or don't know how to explain it So because they didn't go through it. They went to college or university and not apprenticeship. Uh, I just recently heard a story where a high school teacher reached out to multiple organizations saying, you know, I want somebody to come in and talk about apprenticeship and, and nobody got back to them. Um, and, this, and he had a young girl that wants to be an electrician, so he sent her to the guidance office Office and the, the feedback was go to university, you don't want to do that. So there's still a lot of work to be done in the educational system. Um, and we are tapping into that. There's no standardization. It seems like there's multiple ways that you can enter apprenticeship, which can be very confusing. In high school alone, I think there's three or four different ways. Um, and even just walking off the street, you can enter apprenticeship. So that can be very confusing and discouraging if you're not sure where to start. College programs are popping up because as Jan mentioned, there's such a need for skilled trades and and it's a we're in a crisis mode currently so they're developing educational programs at the college level to provide a theory-based uh, start but with that they think they're licensed they think now they've become a licensed journeyman and and that's a lot of misinformation for candidates trying to start an apprenticeship um, Misinformation uh, with employers. I work directly, as I mentioned earlier, with apprentices, with employers, and employers will, will let candidates know a different message than what the ministry will, will tell the candidates or, or people interested in getting into the trades. So that confusion but around everyone involved in apprenticeship can uh, make it challenging to, to continue through the pathway. We're noticing that with, with the ministry involved in apprenticeship, there's lack of communication, working in silos um, from policymakers to frontline workers. So when we're working with apprentices, um, we're improving that process with trying to make sure that we're clearing up any kind of mis misinformation. Um, again, educators don't understand the system. Apprentices, once they actually get into the system, they're not guided on how to manage their education. Um, the next slide will show a map on where we see apprentices are still on their own with trying to navigate through the, this learning pathway. And it can be a, something where, um, you know, they still need a lot of support. So one of the one of the areas that we see apprentices still need a lot of guidance and support with when uh, they're going through clear career exploration and this will Yan will explore expand on this section. Um, but knowing who they are as a person is this the best best pathway for them uh, more work can be done on uh, making sure that they're doing some self reflection is this the best career path for me who they are is this a fit. So um, this is something that we see is needs a lot of work with screening and recruiting when they're going through that career exploration piece. Um, when they're registering as an apprentice, we're finding that um, they need to be hired first. So the key skill set a candidate needs to have is networking. Do they have that soft skill to be able to get out there and meet employers to start their learning? The first, first step is working with that employer. And if they can't sell themselves or present themselves as that ideal candidate, it's really hard to break into that industry. So we're noticing there's a lot of work that needs to be done and supporting apprentices to be able to develop that soft skill set uh, to feel confident and be persistent to get out there and uh, find an employer willing to, to train them. So once they're in the apprenticeship system as well, you can see there's a lot of red with uh, training and on the job learning. Um, there can be, uh, you know, they're, they're, they don't understand how to track their learning, logbook, training standard hours, 
we've noticed working with apprentices over the last four years that um, they're three to four years into their apprenticeship and they didn't realize they had a training standard logbook that they should be tracking their learning or competencies against. Um, they don't understand how to apply for grants or bursary, bursaries available to them or scholarships. Um, and if you have set up a registered educational savings plan for your children, that pathway, the apprenticeship pathway, it's difficult to access that funding. It's, it's more streamlined for college or universities, so there's more hurdles someone would have to go through to be able to access. The other area we're seeing um, apprentices are on their own is the completion part of it. You know, when they go to write the exam, understanding how to prepare for the exam. Um, they're doing most of their learning on the job, as you're aware, and then the exam is four to five hours sitting at a desk regurgitating or, you know, everything they've learned um, and that style of learning did they develop study habits there's anxiety around that so we're noticing we're finding they're forever fifth years out there to just avoid you know writing that exam or um you know they've decided not to complete so completion rates are lower and we're working on uh improving that so lots of friction lots of confusion lots of ambiguity lots of people falling through the cracks Definitely. We've, we've, we've been known for in the group sponsor concept that um, our ministry connection has, has noticed that we're finding those candidates that have fallen through the cracks. Um, and she commends, you know, soy and that group sponsor model to be able to pick them back up and help them finish to completion. Okay, so Glenda, what did you do? What did we do? We've done a lot and we're still doing lots. Um, so, you know, the biggest part that we see, um, you know, this, the group sponsor model, the key is working with employers. So as you mentioned, John, um, the OEL decided they wanted to be a part of the solution, the Ontario Electrical League, a group of contractors said, how can we be a part of this solution? We know employers are key to apprenticeship. If you don't have the employers, we don't have apprentices going through the system. So this progressive group of uh, contractors, um, you know, created the charity that you mentioned, not for profit soy. And we set up the group sponsor. So what is a group sponsor? A group sponsor it means that you have employers and apprentices of the same trade in a group. And what we're doing is to help minimize the work and admin work for the employers. You just hire and train, build us some quality journey persons for the future. We'll take over all that admin paperwork. We'll reduce the risk with making sure we're helping you screen and recruit the right candidate and streamline the process um, to be able to make sure they're completing in a timely manner. So it's it's really something that um, I just wanna mention again, employers are key and we're so lucky to have a group that has helped SOI grow. We grow by associations as well. So not only the Ontario Electrical League, but as we've expanded into other trades, um, we're growing, growing with those associations and a group of employers that have the same vision and philosophy. Um, the other piece that we really, really work hard on um, in partnership with, with Jan is developing a really thorough screening process. Um, the first step is, is doing the personality assessment that Jan will go into more detail with, um, but also we have a phone screen we work on in-person interview um, with our technical mentors, and then we've developed, you know, an added layer of security to make sure we're sending a uh, short list to employers to be able to screen um, uh, on their own. Another key thing that we've noticed is that mentorship is key for, for success in apprenticeship. Uh, so in Support Ontario Youth, we have a technical mentor for each trade that we work with, and um, they are guided and supported uh, throughout their apprenticeship to address any barriers, any uh, be proactive to, to make sure that they don't drop out, figure out what their reasons are, and uh, support them with their learning, whether it's in class or understand um, that any question they might have, even if they're not financially prepared for going back to school, um, you know, we're really here to help and support and mentor. One of the things we've noticed is that apprentices are so used to earning while they're learning, even if they're forgetting the learning piece. So we're coaching and mentoring apprentices on making sure they understand their role in apprenticeship and to be proactive and advocate for their own education. Um, yeah, other things, the key, key, key with soy is that for success, we're doing a part of it. 
but we needed to make sure that we, we uh, partner with key service providers to ensure the success of the group sponsor concept. Um, that would include, you know, a marketing team. Uh, we partnered with we're Fit, Fit First Technologies. And yet again, we'll go into a huge detail about the importance of um, making sure you're finding the right fit, the right candidate for retention and for uh, completion. And then also managing the data. There's a ton of information that apprentices need to manage. And there's a lot of people involved in apprenticeship from the ministry, uh, education, employers, apprentices, so many stakeholders that there's a lot of information that needs to be managed securely and safely. So we partner with Validate to make sure that's done. Um, the first partner I'd like to talk about is TDG, our marketing team. Um, they've done an amazing job to develop the soy brand. Uh, we are four years young, but the work that they've done has really made sure that we have a strong foothold um, and awareness out in the community about support Ontario youth. Um, they, need to, they needed to create something to target multiple groups. We work, like I mentioned, with apprentices, educators, employers. We want to be that one-stop shop to be able to answer any questions anyone might have about apprenticeship. We're, we make sure the information is accurate, up-to-date, and that we are um, transparent. Um, as we mentioned earlier about the confusion, we're addressing that with making sure we're clear and direct about what's needed for candidates wanting to enter the trades and then what we what services we can provide employers. Um, one of the events that we are uh, working on over the next two years is um, working with the Chinese Professionals Association of Canada. And it is a two year try a trade program for immigrant children uh, to be able to enter the skilled trades. So TDG is gonna be working closely with us to be able to interview the students in the program, connecting with them during their work placements and sharing their stories about how they got started in the trades. Um, so real life, real time uh, story about immigrant youth um, getting an opportunity to start their career in the trades. So not only has TDG developed really good marketing and print printing materials for us, um, educational videos, promotional videos, um, but also really making sure our social media platform is active in real time. So whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, that we are posting pictures uh, as events are occurring and increasing our followers that way. Mm -hmm. So they're doing an awesome job to make sure that um, our exposure is getting out there. This last, in 2021, we developed a new division of Support Ontario Youth that we're really excited about. Um, again, we saw a need to connect with candidates wanting to enter into the skilled trades, and maybe they were just missing something uh, a little bit like understanding the culture of the trades or safety training or really not knowing what all was needed to enter it. So Tools of the Trades Bootcamp was started. And with this launch, um, our marketing team was able to expand the marketing strategy even further and link with a local celebrity in interior decorating who has his own TV show. So we're getting exposure uh, with Support Ontario Youth on that platform, increased radio ads, TV commercials, interviews and news articles with, with the boot camp division. So it's a very, really exciting time um, having TDG and all the work they're doing to, to share Support Ontario Youth's vision. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing part of the story, Glenda. And, you know, I think really what this underscores maybe more than anything else in the whole soy story, is the, the tremendous value that comes from taking up the challenge as an industry association. I mean, as, as an entity, soy has been able to do far more than any individual employer could have done on their own, right? And so in terms of creating a face to the marketplace, in terms of creating a brand around support Ontario youth, in terms of actually reaching into the channels and showing up where potential apprentices hang out online as well as in the real world, um, this effort wouldn't have been possible by even a single large employer. I mean, it's, it's the fact that it's the collective effort um, that, has, that has allowed the, the marketing efforts to generate the kind of scale they have. And really the whole objective is to one way or the other, connect people with soy, whether it's at one of the boot camps or whether it's online and, and driving them to the website. And so once they get to the website is really where we start to kick in um, with, with our stuff. So, you know, our objective um, is, is really to give visitors to the website the opportunity to understand clearly, objectively, in simple terms, whether this is something that's likely to work well for them or not. 
And so just, you know, historically for, for us as an organization, you know, we, we started this business, um, as I said, over 15 years ago, really founded in this question of how effectively are we matching talent with opportunity. And, and in our initial work with employers, we knew going in that there was an awful lot of hiring going on in many of those organizations, but there wasn't a lot of really good hiring going on. And that was showing up in a number of different ways. Sometimes it was in turnover. Sometimes it was in low levels of engagement. Sometimes it was internal friction and the organization just really struggling to, to meet its objectives. Almost always when we were speaking to business leaders about, you know, what are, what are the things that the three things that keep you up at night? Two of those three things had something to do with people and not having the right people in the business that we need in order to bring it forward. And so we became very interested in understanding the science of job matching. And, um, and we looked at a whole slew of resources because you know the, the paradox for us was the employers that we were working with were doing all the best practices. You know, if we if we could have looked at best practices from any leading organization, they'd have been able to tick all of the boxes in terms of doing supposedly the correct things that are supposed to yield the results, and yet they weren't. Something was missing, and so we looked at research that was um, that had been ongoing for a number of years at, uh, at Harvard Business Review. Um, we looked at the work that Gallup had done in understanding the factors that lead to engagement in an organization. Um, we tripped across actually this study, which, which was an, an interesting turning point for us. So this is research that was done um, that has been ongoing at the University of Manchester in England for um, a number of years now. And it really underscores the, the crux of the issue in most organizations. So what they were studying is the predictive value of each of the bits of data that organizations collect about people as they're taking them through the selection process. And so down the, down the middle of the screen, you've got the, 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 the list of items, the bits of information that organizations would collect. The numbers down the middle of the slide are the predictive value of each in terms of predicting somebody's likelihood of success on the job. And of course, the bigger the number, the greater the reliability, the greater the predictive value of that element. And the piece that leapt out to us, out to us as soon as we saw the chart was the pieces that are in the resume, and you might even add interests to that, even if they're true, even if what you're reading in the resume is true, they have very low predictive value. And, and the paradox was that, you know, in, in, almost every instance, the organizations that we had worked in and the organizations that we were working with in a client relationship, when they've got an open position, you post the job and you ask people to send in their resume. And so we became curious to see what if we could actually start the selection process with the most predictive values, the, the pieces that give you the, 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 the most valuable information around somebody who, somebody's likelihood of success in the role. And, um, and so we, we created a platform for employers and then modified it for this work with Support Ontario Youth and now many other installations where we've been doing similar work. But the, the, the screening point begins with who the person is. The screening begins with the person's behavioral thumbprint, their core attitudes, the things about them that frankly don't change appreciably over a long period of time as well as their critical thinking and reasoning. So how do they deal with ambiguity? How do they apply logic? How do they think on their feet day to day? And is that a fit for the, um, the reality that's waiting for them in the organization? And so we leaned into um, um, a model of behavioral science uh, that's not new. It's been around for about three decades. It's called the big five. So the big five traits would be the ones that are in bold on this slide. So agreeableness, openness, extroversion, stability, and conscientiousness. They fall loosely into the categories as you see them on the slide. So they're, they're traits related to how the person gets along with others, how they deal with change, how they show up in the world as an individual, how they deal with challenge and adversity, and how they approach their work. We knew in the original build as we started to work on this that the big five is rock solid because it has been around 30 years. It's the most thoroughly researched and validated body of science as it relates to. Um, you know, predicting somebody's likelihood of success in a role, but we also knew that the big five alone is a bit of a blunt instrument. And so we set aside, set out to create another 20 much finer expressions of those big five traits, which is what you see in the rest of the list here. And along the way, we also um, 
took the ONET occupation library and had our science team create a set of behavioral patterns for every one of the 1300 or so occupations in the ONET occupation library. And one of those obviously was for electrician. So, so this is what the pattern looks like. And it was, you know, we, we tweaked and adapted it a little bit to the work specifically with soy, but our, our objective was to help them screen into conversation with the organization people who are likelier to be happier electricians, first and foremost. So they need to be a good fit with um, you know, the, 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 the requirements of the job. But we also wove into that some elements of uh, grit or tenacity, if you like. So we, we were looking for indicators that would suggest that somebody would be more likely to see through the commitment to five years apprenticeship. Um, and, and that all worked its way into the behavioral job pattern that you see here. And so, you know, back to the list, you know, I think part of, part of the magic that we bring is this is very person-centric as an approach. Most employers go to market with, um, you know, all the reasons why you should work with us, all the reasons why this is a great career for you, all the reasons why, you know, it's, and, and frankly, in most cases, it's BS and it just starts the, starts the, the ball rolling downhill in their own direction. Our objective here has been really twofold. One is let's give people the opportunity to understand their own behavioral makeup, their own behavioral traits, because that self-awareness is valuable to an individual. Let's give them data, going back to the previous um, chart, let's show them where they score against the ideal for the position so they can understand in objective terms why this might or might not be a good fit for them. And now we've expanded the library so there are other positions that we can project them into. And once we get them over the hump of understanding why this might be a good fit for them, the next objective is to give them realistic day in the life information about how this person spends their day. And that's a big part of what Glenda Soy's worked into the um, the boot camps as well, you know, the, 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 the shows the, the, you know, the one day pre apprenticeships that you're doing at high schools, it gives people the opportunity, they know they've been screened into the one day pre apprenticeship, so they know behaviorally, it's a good fit for them. And that one day is instrumental in giving them the opportunity to try on the job for a day and see how it feels. And so those are important, um, important pieces of information for the individual in, in deciding whether this is the right thing for them. And more importantly, I think what it does is it gives them objective information that most people don't have access to. You go to your guidance counselor, they're gonna give you the best advice they can, but do they really know? And in, and, and in most cases, most guidance counselors would freely acknowledge they don't have a clue and they don't have the tools they need to do the jobs that they're there to do because they don't have the information. They just don't have the knowledge. So one of the outcomes of this work, and it's, and it's happened with soy, but it's a pattern that we see with many of the employers that we work with as well. Um, people start telling us, you know, what's cool about this is you're helping us find great people in surprising packages. The fact that we don't start from the resume and that we don't screen people out or exclude them because they don't have a certain degree or they don't have a certain pattern of employment leading up to this. The fact that we're just starting with, instead of looking for the right resume, looking for the right person in the applicant pool and focusing on them means that you can't help but end up with a more diverse group of candidates to look at. It just happens as a natural byproduct. And so what we've, what we've seen, and Glenda, I know we've, we've talked about this often. I mean, the, yes, it benefits the employers because we're screening in apprentices that are really well suited to the job, but there's a real benefit to the individual as well in the sense that, you know, they know that they're better matched. Um, they know the reasons why they're there. And, um, and it takes a lot of the uncertainty out of, um, out of any decisions they need to make in the process. Yeah. So, and just to add to that, I know that we do coaching calls, you know, so if someone reaches out to soy and um, they've scored high enough, that we think they'd be a good fit based on um, the fit first assessment. 
then we help them and coach them on their next steps. You know, like that's the start. They believe this is a good path for them. And how else can we help with making sure they get there? Um, the tool has also been really useful, you know, from the employer perspective. I know that we've had probably over 6,000 applicants apply to SOI. And if they go through that first initial personality assessment, screening, critical thinking, reasoning, um, that could be narrowed down for us, you know, to 500 or so. So, so we're dealing with a smaller pool to really go through and, and continue with our pre-screening process. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, it's so essential to make sure that that piece is done well, like you mentioned, you know, look at the candidate. Are they a fit? Is this something they want to do? Are they in it for the long haul? Um, is it a good fit for the employer? And back to the fact that Support Ontario Youth's whole creation is based on uh, employers and what they are looking for and how we can help them find the right candidates so that they want to train them uh, through their apprenticeship um, it is key. And the other piece that we want to move into now um, another partner is all that information and data to support an apprentice and all the other stakeholders involved. Um, we've developed a uh, apprentice digital logbook in partnership with Validate. And they've been in this space for 30 or so more years in apprenticeship worldwide. So they're very knowledgeable about um, apprenticeship. And it is an easily accessible uh, program, uh, cloud-based program for apprentices to manage. Um, you know, we want to be a part of that. We want to be a part of revolutionizing apprenticeship in Ontario uh, and developing a digital platform, something that's not, not available now. Um, from registration to management of apprenticeship, there's a lot that's involved. So um, it, is, it is really necessary that um, this tool is a part of SOI as we grow, um, because um, as you'll understand from our first year to now, uh, we've increased our you know, uh, applicants for apprentices by three times we expected to, uh, to see happen. So from an apprentice's perspective, like I mentioned, they can easily access their, access their information. Um, update any safety training, uh, competency tracking by um, uploading videos or pictures and any other docs to be able to track their learning. Um, they also can, um, you know, track any, any other education they've done can be all um, put, put inside this, um, housed in this platform. Uh, trainers and mentors can go in the back end and, and verify what they've learned. There's ways to, you know, simply um, look at a video and timestamp and, and compare it against competencies in the training standard um, specific specific to that trade. So it's so we see the value um, from an apprentice's perspective for them to understand and take ownership for their learning and know that this is their tool to manage um, and to make sure that their portfolio is accurate and up to date. Um, and that if they, you know, there is that mobility piece uh, with a group sponsor um, because there's a more multiple employers and apprentices in a group um, and soy holding the registered training agreement, there's that mobility piece where they can go from employer to employer and all their information will be housed on, on this digital platform. Um, it provides proof of their work. That's something that we're noticing over the last four years. Apprentices, again, it's a mind shift for them to take ownership, but they just haven't been tracking their learning. They're focusing on the earning, they're focusing on the job and not really seeing it as that educational pathway. So this will get them to shift their mind and, oh, this is my learning. I need to make sure I'm tracking. I want to be a top journey person when I graduate. I want to know that I know the whole scope of the trade. And this is a, a, an excellent platform to be able to do that. Safe, secure, which is something else that's key because there's multiple organizations and groups involved in apprenticeship. So if there's multiple people accessing this, we want to make sure it's in a safe, secure site. Well, it's it's cool. I mean, the um, sorry. Let me just go back for a second because I, I think to 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 finish up about the validate platform. It's it's incredibly easy to use. I mean, for an apprentice, they can set up their iPhone and videotape themselves demonstrating a skill and upload that into the platform so that um, they can be signed off on that skill as they go. So for the individual, it's seamless. It's effortless. It just happens as as part of the day. And like all of the other um, solutions that Soy's brought to the table, this platform also meets the needs of all the stakeholders in the universe, right? So there's there's huge benefits for Soy as administrators of the platform, in the sense that you've got aggregated information at your fingertips. The reporting is really easy and straightforward, um, and 
it allows you to advocate for grants um, for employers and for others in the in the system because you've got the evidence backing the um, the grant application, and and for employers there are huge benefits as you mentioned. I mean, it's just the 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 ability to take the friction and the administrative burden off the hands of employers and make it really easy for them to sign their uh, their people off as they're as they're demonstrating skills. It's um, it's it's all a really critical part of the story. So no surprise, you know, that we three years later were finding these numbers. And you know, we we talked in the in the initial slide about how pretty consistently soy has been hitting 200% of their hiring objectives. Um, Glenda, you've got an update to that, I think. Uh, yes, like we're, we're three times, like I mentioned, three times the number of apprentices we expected to register. And I know through the Ontario uh, Electrical League, um, you know, they're hitting targets within the first month. They're, they're hitting their annual target within the first month of what they expected to register. Yeah, huge. That's insane. And so all of you know what we've what we've put on the table here in front of you. I think explains the high satisfaction rates. You know, and and what I would what I would add to qualify that is the is the bullet that I added to this slide that um, that didn't appear on the first one. Which is you know there's there's a couple of distinctions here that I think are critical in explaining the success. The first is, um, you know, the the distinction between screening people in versus screening people out. You know, in most cases, employers are looking at a stack of resumes and deciding who they can get rid of, um, which resumes they can get rid of to get down to the short list of people they're going to be looking at more closely. And in actual fact, in this approach, what Soy has been doing is screening people in based on who they are and what their potential is and not penalizing them because of a funny looking resume or any other labels that we might attach to them. The, um, the result of all of that is the second distinction here, which is leaning in versus leaning out. And, and the way I describe that is, you know, when you think about most hiring in most organizations, if you, you know, when you survey the people who were hired and the managers who hired them, Nobody outside the HR department typically has a lot of confidence in the accuracy of the hiring process. So, you know, the, the posture of many people starting a new job is they're leaning back. You know, they're, they're leaning back to see if this is going to work out, if this is worthwhile, if this has been the right decision. And they're waiting for some kind of sign from the organization before they fully buy in and engage and roll up their sleeves and, and get to work. And because hiring managers similarly don't have a lot of confidence in the process, they're leaning back and waiting to see, because you know we've, I've, I've seen this succession of people that have come to work for a day or a week and they leave again. So there's suspicion, there's, uh, there's aloofness, there's waiting for some kind of sign from the person that they're gonna be worth my while to invest time and energy in. And when you think about that, leaning out posture with both the manager and the person they hired, that kicks off a cascade of just predictable things. You know, if, if nobody's really vested in the decision, the, the outcome is predictable. It's not gonna work, it's not gonna stick, it's mediocre at best. And I think what we've seen here is because the individuals got objective information and hands-on experience around why this is a good choice for them, and because the employers bought in on this process that Soy's put together, and we give them the tools to understand why the individuals they're meeting are a really strong fit for the reality that's waiting for them in their organization, we now have a relationship where both partners are leaning in from the beginning, from day one. And I think it's that, that leaning in posture gives a different energy. It gives, it gives a different level of confidence and commitment to making the relationship work, which is part of the reason why the satisfaction rates are so high. It's part of the reason why the attrition rates are so low. And, and the really cool hidden dividend here is the fact that, um, you know, what they, Soy had some obligation to the province to, to bring in more women, more visible minorities, more new Canadians, more uh, people with disabilities and more indigenous people into the trade. 
And, um, and before they'd had the opportunity to do any really meaningful outreach into those communities, they discovered to their surprise that nearly a quarter of the people they'd hired come from those populations. And so what, the, you know, what, they, what they learned was when you start with focusing on potential and aptitude and, and give up on screening for some of the other things and looking for specific labels or patterns of experience or education, you can't help but end up with a more diverse group of employees and candidates in the applicant pool. So Glenda, I know you've got a great story to share and, um, and I'd love to hear it. I've heard snippets, but I haven't heard the whole thing. Okay. Well, Sabim um, came to Canada in 2017. And uh, when I first met him, I thought this, this gentleman has a great attitude coming to a new country, deciding that he wanted to take a whole new career path as a second career um, is, a, is a huge challenge, a huge undertaking. And we knew he would, we'd, he'd be somebody we'd want to support, not only because the personality assessment gave us that information, but meeting him and seeing his positive attitude and his desire and his uh, drive um, to, to start a new life in Canada, um, a, great, a great candidate. So registering him as an apprentice, all the wraparound supports and resources we could provide him, um, he had to persevere. There is challenges with trying to find employers that were willing to work with him. So helping him with those network strategies, um, educating him on the culture of the trades because again he had no experience um, but and also supporting him with other there's a lot of agencies out there so again that collaboration piece on working with other agencies that provide you know maybe provided funding for safety training so he was uh ready for work um driver's license vehicle all those things he would have to to get coming into canada so he was something that wanted he was somebody that wanted to learn and he was somebody that was willing to do the work um, he even had to have a part-time job to be able to supplement his income as he was working through the educational pathway and learning uh, a new skill set. I know with conversation with him, he was saying if there's one thing he would have uh, maybe done a little differently was learn some theory up front. Um, but really, when we talk to employers, just getting out there with a positive attitude and he had that drive. So he's, he's still with us today. He's his third year apprentice and um, he's persistent to complete this. He's completed his basic block, uh, which is his first level of in-class learning. And he feels um, he's someone that has earned that respect on a job site. Um, and someone with Muslim faith and his culture has been, um, you know, they've accepted him as a whole person and uh, he's really excited to continue his apprenticeship and he does not want to leave soy. He's like, I so appreciate all the support. I talk to him probably every month, you know, uh, just to keep him on track and to support and guide. And he is just so appreciative of everything we offer to him. Oh, that, well, that really underscores the value of soy as this safety net. Right. right, as this as this central go to that will answer questions and provide support and resources to both apprentices and employers and make sure that they are equipped for success on both sides of the ledger. Yeah, and he's someone that you know we knew it was going to be a tough start. So holding his registered trainer agreement again allows that mobility uh, with with multiple employers just to get some traction, build some hours, get some experience. Um, he knew that his. Uh, apprenticeship was going to be safe, you know, with with soy as he went through went through that process. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so we focused on the before picture. We focused on the in between bits and the journey. Um, what's what's the future hold? Look at this. Three years later, I have to say that the first two years we we had two trades. <laughs> So now we're entering our fourth year and last year, um, partially because the ministry, you know, the group sponsor concept uh, was such a success, they created funding as a group sponsor available to other organizations that might be interested in uh, developing this model. Um, so that alone says a lot. And when we put new applications into the ministry, um, the turnaround time is a lot quicker now for approval because of the success and, and how it's working within our structure. Um, on the construction side, uh, we've moved into HVAC, uh, the heating and ventilation air conditioning system. There's a lot of work that needs to be done there because electrical and plumbing was a trade that everyone seemed to know Know about, um, but the HVAC sector, um, I could say, is kind of the forgotten trade or the the you know the trade that um, they wouldn't even think about. So there is more 
uh, on regulation in that sector. So I have a lot of work ahead of me um, with developing that, that sector. I'm excited about that. On the industrial side, um, what we've noticed with this model that it doesn't, it, it works with small to mid-sized contractors because we know that they're a group that do need that admin support. They don't have HR, so they appreciate, you know, soy taking over the admin paperwork and managing apprenticeship and doing the registration. But we also hear from uh, the industrial side, which includes more large corporations, um, that they appreciate that. Their HR team is overworked. They have a lot of other things they need to manage. Um, so if, if soy will take over um, sort of the building their pipeline Line within those companies and managing apprenticeship within their organizations, um, they are all for it. So we have, you know, companies that are na national companies, but we're testing this pilot within Ontario uh, with these national companies. So, um, yeah, so the industrial side it is growing. Um, we are looking at going into welding as well because, again, we grow by associations that reach out to soy and currently. Um, We've been hearing from welding uh, companies and associations that there's such a need for that trade. So that's another trade we're looking at. And then also expanding into the automotive sector very soon. Uh, Napa um, Auto Pro says we want to work with soy um, and we want to expand um, not like across Ontario to to work in the automotive sector and the group sponsor model. So we're very excited about that. And that's going to have soy explode even more um, over this next year. Excellent. What else? Mm -hmm. So because we've streamlined and developed uh, a way to um, um, bring in associations, apply for the group sponsor, adjust as needed uh, for each association, um, tweak it you know, for that specific group sponsor model, um, we want to expand more into, as you mentioned, John, how can we build more wraparound supports uh, for those new Canadians? Uh, we recognize that this is a huge area that can be tapped into because of the fact that they come to this country with, with a skill set already. And how can we make sure they get into the system and quickly? Um, there's such a need for skilled trades. Some of them would come already licensed, um, but maybe they, they don't understand the culture of trades in Ontario. How can we educate them on that? And also educate employers to be willing to take someone with that skill set. Um, there's, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, there's concern around safety and um, language barriers. So we want to work with supportive agencies to make sure we're providing that ideal candidate that's a new Canadian to be able to work in Ontario with employers within support Ontario youth. Oh, and speaking um, of language barriers, don't forget, we, we've also just translated the, um, the questionnaire right? into Ukrainian. Right. So, you know, we know that there are going to be a, um, a lot of Canadians coming not only into Canada and the US, but obviously through Western Europe as well. And, you know, why not mm -hmm. twist up the tool in such a way that it's easily accessible to Ukrainians as a tool to help them in resettling? Yes, wonderful. It's awesome. There's, uh, there's a lot of potential for sure. And uh, we're all about collaboration and making sure that we provide, you know, a system that works and is sustainable. Um, and uh, they're supported throughout their apprenticeship. Uh, the next area we all know that there's a huge um, market to tap into is women. Uh, there's a lot of us out there. So, so there's, there's so much potential um, to, to bring women into this sector. Um, we're excited about hosting an event next week, actually, um, at our office. And we, we are going to have, um, you know, a keynote speaker, a young lady who, as a welder, uh, going to share her story. But we also have other mentors that have been in the industry for over 15 years to share, um, you know, the trials and tribulations that they went through um, with, with women in the skilled trades. And we always want to be authentic and we always want to share real information. Uh, we'll slightly sugarcoat it so it doesn't scare them off. Um, but it, it's more about providing uh, resources, educating, and um, that mentorship support. There's, there's going to be an opportunity for them to network with employers at that event as well. So we want to get involved more in that space and partner with, you know, organizations like Builder Dream or Women in HVAC and many others that are out there um, bringing awareness and, and uh, making sure women know young like grade seven and eight about this pathway um and, and entering in the trades and, and exposing them to it so similar to you know of which i'll talk about soon the boot camps right it's it's, a, it's an opportunity to have that day um working on the tools um but uh, another area that soy really wants to put a lot of energy into um, i just want to talk a bit about developing mentors um, support Ontario youth as our apprentices. We are in our fourth year, so we do have apprentices that are starting to complete um, their apprenticeship. And we want to work hard at the third uh, phase of their apprenticeship to develop a holistic 
uh, person that wants to give back, that wants to mentor, that wants to understand how to teach and train and be that person um, to build that succession plan of apprentices within the educational pathway of apprenticeship. There's a lot of work that will need to be done there. So we're excited about doing that. Um, 20 last year, as we mentioned, we have a new division of Support Ontario Youth called Tools in the Trade Bootcamp. Um, huge success. Uh, they, they completed, I think, over uh, 70 boot camps across the province of Ontario, directly linked with high schools. Um, so they, as John mentioned, went through the pre-screening with a personality assessment uh, to make sure that they were a fit for this day. Um, the day included an opportunity um, to develop soft skill development. If I mentioned earlier, that part is something that really needs a lot of work on. And some of the feedback we received from candidates that were at the event said they really appreciated that information <laughs> those resources, um, uh, that that skill set, the tips on how to get out there and network. It's, you know, it's hard to kind of sell yourself and build that confidence. Um, well, and it's stuff people don't often bother to tell them or share with them. Right. Bring me a coffee and, you know, say hi. And, you know, can I ask you a few questions about what it's like to work for your company? I'm thinking about pursuing a career in the trades, you know, like that's not easy. So, so that's going to take some time to develop, but the tools in the trade bootcamp offered um, half the day with um, uh, that kind of education, uh, then a networking event with employers so they can start, so they could practice that. And then the other half of the day was uh, getting on the tools. They left with $250 worth of tools to take home with them, but at the event they could use those tools. And um, we're noticing just the interaction, the engagement, the the excitement of uh, the whole day. They left feeling so excited about thinking about this pathway that they maybe didn't consider before or didn't really know what was involved um, holistically that uh, they were, you know, they were really to, willing to take it on. And then the percentage of women that we had attend, as you can see, um, you know, over 16% of women and over 600 apprentices registered in the system in partnership with the high schools at these events. That's mm -hmm. amazing. That's absolutely incredible. And so um, it's been quite a journey, Glenda. Let's let's talk about key learnings for just a second. Yeah, I think, you know, we're really proud. It's been a lot of work. I, I know, Jan, that it was three of us that started this group, and now we're up to over 50, I think, within SOI. Uh, but the first couple of years, it was a small group, right, building this concept. And really working hard at retention. How can we make sure that we're finding the right people? And we're really proud of the fact that um, the people that we have in the system want to stay in the system and they want to stay with soy if they can. Um, streamlining it, making it simpler, like you mentioned, like taking away some of the burden from employers. They're so excited about that. I still hear, um, you know, even from ministry reps or from employers, where were you 20 years ago? Hmm. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited I found you. Uh, you're like, um, you're magic. I think, oh, I'm one, I'm magic. <laughs> Um, you know, and <laughs> employer participation is it, so key, you know, it, it's just we're so excited to really find those employers and associations that see a vision, um, want to work from a different platform, think outside the box and be a part of the solution. Um, so we're really excited about that. Excellent. Uh, what caught you by surprise? Just, just even, um, you know, the confusion, the lack of information, but also within the, you know, uh, ministry itself, the ministry that manages apprenticeship, they're, they work in silos and there's lack of communication there. So it's, it can be challenging to navigate um, how to communicate and work with apprentices through the system. We try to be, you know, um, as truthful, as authentic as possible. And then we get a different mis message. So it's, it can be confusing and there's a lot of uncertainty still. So the, so the lack of dysfunction didn't surprise you. The extent of the dysfunction surprised you. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so yeah. learnings, learnings moving forward, what would you do differently next time? I am really passionate about the mentor piece, like mentoring employers and mentoring our apprentices be, to become those uh, journey persons that want to mentor. So, you know, there, there's such a need for um, what we're building on the apprenticeship side to parallel what can be built for employers. Um, not all employers were meant, were, you know, made up to train, they don't have it in their, their makeup to be educators or want to stop and kind of teach. They're running a business. There's a lot to think about. A lot of the apprenticeship burden is on the employer um, because we need them to do the training. 85% of the learning is done on the job. So um, really supporting employers and helping them through this pathway so they feel like, you know, they've got all the tools they need um, would be something I would, you know, continue to work with. 
Excellent. And I would say one of the big learnings for us, and it was it was articulated by Stephen at one point early in, in our work, and it was put a little bit differently by a different client. And it's this phrase that that particular client dropped into a conversation that stuck with us. He said, there, you know, what we've what we've learned here is aptitude is evenly distributed in the population, opportunity is not. And as he elaborated on that, what he, what he was saying was, you know, when you think about what's in the resume, it really is nothing more than a, a summary of the opportunity somebody's had access to up until now in their life in terms of access to meaningful education, access to skills development, access to employment that is beyond subsistence uh, and actually teaches them and stretches them and pushes them to, to grow as an individual. Access to networks is another huge component. And, and so when, when you get rid of the resume as the initial screening point and you really focus on aptitude, all of a sudden you're going to find people who are really well suited to your open position all around you. You just need to wear a different set of glasses to see them, different lens. Mm -hmm. and, and why I threw that in here is I was at a conference two weeks ago in, in Washington, DC, and one of the lunchtime speakers was a really interesting guy. He described himself as a lifer. So he'd, he'd been at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta for a long time. And he, he reminded me a little bit of Lou Grant from the Mary Tyler Moore Show. So a little bit gruff, you know, did, he'd been around long enough that he really didn't care what people thought about him. He just spoke his piece. And, and it was interesting because he was talking about the, the current situation in the labor market in, in North America, but it, 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 it exists in exactly the same way in just about every country in the world. And he said, what we're, what we're finding here is historically, if you look at patterns, the pendulum would, would always swing back and forth between being an employer's market or you know, being in favor of job seekers. And you know, currently, obviously, it's very much in favor of job seekers. There are you know, well over 10 million jobs in North America that are open that aren't being filled and everybody's scratching their head over the reasons why. And, and, and this guy boiled it down to the fundamentals of population. And he described it as five headwinds that I won't go into, but essentially when you, when you look at demographics, people are retiring. We've been unfriendly to outsiders. And, and in many cases, um, you know, foreigners have left our countries. Um, you know, there, there are all these challenges that we're facing, including different expectations on the part of individuals in terms of, you know, no longer preparing to, uh, prepared to tolerate sometimes what they were tolerating with their job pre-pandemic. And he said, for the first time in history, I don't see this pendulum swinging back anytime soon. And for those of us in the workforce development space, for those of us in the talent development space, I think that serves as a really clear warning and, and really underscores, Glenda, the value of what SOI has done as an industry association to make sure that you're cultivating your own talent, that you're doing a good job of getting it right the first time, putting the right person in the right training for the right occupation so that we stop this insanity of throwing people at jobs and hoping they stick. And when they don't, picking them up again and throwing them against something else and hoping that works. That, the way we've done this in the past is, is not only exceedingly bad and wasteful, it's going to make the current situation with labor shortages and, and this talent crisis much worse than it needs to be. And, and I think this really gives us a reason to focus together collectively as an employment ecosystem around how best to optimize the talent and the people in um, in this region, in this, in the, in this, whatever the, whatever the region is that we're working in. So with that said, if, um, if you guys were with us in Vegas, this is where we would shut up and, um, and entertain questions and I'm sure have a really, really interesting conversation. Um, but because this is virtual for those of you who were unable to attend and join us in Vegas, um, we'll throw up contact information because I expect that there are going to be a whole lot of questions and thoughts. Um, I'd love nothing better than to hear from you, Glenda. I'm sure you would also. Um, and for so sure. for anybody that would like more information that would that has questions, that would like a bit more background, that would like to talk about 
you know the reality and the situation that are in their marketplace um we will receive you with open arms and so uh, obviously we didn't meet today but we look forward to meeting you on the other side of this yes thank you um any questions for sure about apprenticeship and group sponsor model employers have questions always love to share